Good morning. Our committee's full tribute to Dr. Sandra Pearl appears in the program book. So my introduction will be brief because she wants to talk to us. <laughs> and her remarks will be published in a future issue of College Composition and Communication. So I will note just a few of her impressive accomplishments. Dr. Pearl's Looking Both Ways initiative started in 1998 and ran through 2006. It brought high school and college writing instructors together to share their experiences about teaching and assessing writing. She developed the City University of New York's innovative writing across the curriculum program, which was mandated by CUNY's Board of um, Trustees in 1999. In recent years, she worked with digital technologies and composing genres, demonstrating what it means to be a lifelong learner. Dr. Pearl has left an incredible mark on in our profession through her dynamic speaking in public forums, on numerous panels, and writing workshops at national and local conferences. Her work with Austrian teachers influenced her to work with the Memorial Library to create the Holocaust Educators Network, model of the National Writing Project, which she has directed since its inception. Dr. Sandra Pearl shows us how to enter into new, unfamiliar projects with an inquisitive mind and open heart. I am pleased to present the 2016 exemplar, Dr. Sandra Pearl. Thank you, Geneva, members of the Selection Committee, Rebecca Milinarsic and George Adi, who nominated me for this amazing honor. And thank you to the colleagues, too numerous to name today, who wrote letters of support on my behalf. Thank you all so much. It is both daunting and humbling to stand here this morning as the 2016 exemplar. Daunting because how can one sum up a life devoted to the teaching of writing in six minutes? <laughs> Humbling, because so many of you here today, truly, and so many of those who have received this honor in the past are my exemplars, colleagues from whom I have drawn insight and inspiration for the past 45 years. 45 years. <laughs> That's like half of someone's lifetime. So, but it is the number of years I have taught full-time at the City University of New York. 45 years working at a public institution which has provided me with the freedom to create classes and seminars on absolutely any topic that interested me and has filled those classes with students who range in age from 18 to 80, native-born New Yorkers, or more often than not, those who travel to New York from just about every corner of the world, most the first in their families to dream of obtaining a college education. As some of you know, I decided to retire this year. The Exemplar Award then marks an end to my work at CUNY and has given me the opportunity to reflect on my years as a compositionist. It's given me a chance to think about what it means to be a teacher 
and to have been part of a generation of scholars who embraced writing as a way of learning and as a process deeply embedded in our own ways of coming to understand and shape our knowledge. What I'd like to do now is describe what has supported me in doing this work for 45 years. First, this organization. I attended my first C's in 1976. I was then in my fourth year as a full-time instructor at Ostos Community College in the South Bronx, while also enrolled in a doctoral program at NYU. Having read every article in every issue of the three C's as part of my literature review, and taking notes on yellow-lined paper, I was curious about the authors. I wanted to see who spoke here, what the sessions were like, and if this was a place I might want to return to. The answers are obvious. At the age of 29, I walked into a world I have never left. What I found was a world in which debates about writing were at the center, where excitement reigned over what we didn't know and what we might learn, where I discovered colleagues who shared my values, and where I entered into friendships that have lasted a lifetime. I found a professional home. As someone who saves things, a trait I am now trying to unlearn at this point in my life, I still have the conference program. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> okay, yes, I have often used it literally in graduate seminars to demonstrate in material terms how our field has grown. So here's a bit of data. The 1976 program totals 84 pages compared to the current 368. In 1976, there were nine session blocks with an average of 16 sessions per block or a total of 144 sessions. Today, not counting SIGs, pre and post convention workshops, action hubs, and you see it, all of that, we average, we have a total of 13 blocks with an average of 38 sessions per block, totaling 900, 494 sessions, which is an increase of over 300%. And Thursday night was not the night for the Bedford party. In, <laughs> nope. In 1976, from 8 to 10 p.m., we held the tiny little D block with four sessions. On the back cover, I jotted a note to myself, dinner on Wednesday night, $15.41, $2 tip included. <laughs> so the point is, obviously, the times have changed dramatically and that we have grown as an organization exponentially. But what strikes me is interesting is that the theme in 1976 was a question, what's really basic? Followed by three sub-questions, what do we know, who do we serve, how do we serve? Forty years ago, we were asking essential questions. I think it's the stance we take here that we continue to ask essential questions, that we continue to want to discover what we don't know that has kept me coming back. My second professional home is the National Writing Project. It is within the writing project that I have grown as a classroom teacher. I was going to say matured. <laughs> it's both. <laughs> Where the principles that guide my teaching were formed and sustained. These principles animate what I do. To me, they are self-evident. As I mention them briefly, I hope they will speak to your own classroom practice. First, when I look out at my students in my classroom, I see writers. My teaching is aimed at the writer I see in each of them, whether or not they are capable of recognizing the writer in themselves. I say this because as human beings, we are makers, in particular, makers of meaning. And to me, this is the essential work of teaching writing, honoring the maker in each student. Second, it's important for each of us who teaches writing to have a sustained practice of writing. We need to be engaged in the craft and in the struggles. It makes us better teachers. Third, drafts need to be read aloud in small groups. Why? Because we need to hear our own words in our ears. We need to feel them in our mouths. We need to sense them in our bodies. 
Nothing does this better than reading aloud, especially to a receptive audience. Fourth, all the voices in our classrooms need to be heard, even when we disagree, or more importantly, especially when we disagree. Fifth, a truly emancipatory pedagogy includes the ability to listen, both to what students are saying and to their silences. And sixth, teaching today needs to embrace the digital, which offers exciting new avenues for making, for composing, and along with this, new avenues for teaching and for research. I have been able to test these ideas, to enact my beliefs, to observe what happens when these principles are turned into practice in my 45 years in this profession. So I'd like to close with an image that comes from my classroom. It's an image of students sitting together in groups. It's an image of students reading their drafts out loud, sharing their work, and listening generously to one another. It's an image in which students lower their voices to say something revealing, or pause to put a hand on another's shoulder, or of students smiling and laughing together, finding a shared you know, com commonality and shared stories, and sometimes sharing a moment of sadness and wiping away a tear. It's an image that never feels f fails to touch me, for what I see in those groups is a vision of a democratic classroom where students' ideas and students' voices are center stage, and where listening and engaging in dialogue are the central components that move the work forward. I don't know of a more powerful way to teach students that it is possible to see beyond our differences, beyond what separates us from one another, than in the daily work of making and sharing the meanings that come to us through writing. For 45 years, I have found this work to be profoundly sustaining, and I thank you for honoring it by honoring me. Thank you.